witchcraft. What it really is witchcraft? Well, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul uh, named witchcraft as a work of the flesh in Galatians. Uh, it's also translated sorcery and some, but witchcraft is basically counterfeit spiritual authority. Now, I think it's, you know, we think of the black magic and the dark arts and things like that as being witchcraft, and that is a form. But I think the most deadly form is from the good side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, human goodness, <laughs> I think, has been far more deadly than the evil of that tree. Now, white witchcraft, or what I call charismatic witchcraft, not in any way implying it had to do with the charismatic movement or anything, but it's based in human charisma. It's used in manipulation, hype, control, pressuring, you know, uh, all these things. God has more dignity than to accomplish his work with those kinds of methods. That is not his, you know, his authority. And we see that the way it enters, I think we can see with King Saul on the day the kingdom was rent from him was because he was told by Sam, Samuel to wait to offer the sacrifice. But when he saw the enemies gathering and the people scattering, he caved into the pressure and offered the sacrifice. He did something he had no authority to do. He was a Benjamite. He wasn't a Levite. He wasn't qualified to offer sacrifices to the Lord. So he crossed a line beyond the sphere of authority God had given to him. And then you're on your own. And when you start trying to do things that he has not called you or commissioned you to do or to do it prematurely, you're out there on your own and you're going to have to use carnal power and all to accomplish those things. And it's going to grow. And that's why we see Saul actually spending his last night in the house of a witch. He had been operating in witchcraft for a long time, an authority that was counter to God's authority. <clears throat> Well, this is kind of a, a, this is like a scary place for uh, Christians uh, to be careful how they conduct themselves. You even brought up um, a point of the Christians kind of being unwittingly used by Satan to be accuser of the accusers of the brethren. You know, that's his that's his title. How did we get involved in that? Well, you know, I believe Satan's been kicked out of heaven but he still has access by using those who do have access. He even has us accusing one another before God. And, uh, and you know, the Lord ever lives to intercede. And, you know, I think that is the, the, uh, the great power of his authority is it starts with intercession it starts with us investing and praying for people. And then you've got an investment. And then you've got a hope. You want to see good things happen. You want to see the fruit come of that. But Satan has us, you know, one of the things he's doing is stirring us up to always accuse one another, blame one another and all. And um, yeah, it, it's tragic, but... I think right now it is my opinion, and I know the other stronghold you may want to mention, the religious spirit actually has more authority in the church today, or I should say power. There's a difference between power and authority. Satan has power in the world today, but he doesn't have the authority. Jesus has all authority. But anyway, he's still given power, influence, and I think there's Right now, the religious spirit has more influence in the church today than the Holy Spirit does. And I think he, the devil's using witchcraft. He's using racism. He's using the accuser. He's using all of these things to gain domination or influence and control over Christians. So what do we do? What, what do we do as the people of God? As a, what do Tom, Angela, and Sydney do today? What does the viewer that's watching today do to b 
be ready for the battle that may be coming from angles we don't expect. Well, I think one thing we do is we arm ourselves. We put on the full armor of God. Which I think very few Christians do or have. I think we put that on. We understand we need this armor because we're in a battle. And we got to fight. And, you know, as I understand, you can't just stand up in the middle of a battle and call time out. You know, it's day and night. We are in the fight continually right now. We need to understand it. But God made us to be warriors. We should be thriving in the battle because you cannot have a victory without a battle. You cannot have a big victory without a big battle. So we should see these things as the opportunities God has made them to be. You know, James said, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. A trial is a battle. If we would go at it like, thank the Lord for this new trial, I'm going to take more ground, I'm going to grow in this. Or what Peter even said, he said the testing of our faith was more valuable than gold. So if we're truly wise, we should... When we have a test coming our way, we should get more excited than if we had just found a big bag of gold. That's what he said. I think if we understood things from the heavenly, eternal perspective, we would. And if we weren't so bound to this temporary world. 